Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and today I want to present part 11 of my series of the Selected Gross Pathology of the Dog, and part 11 is going to be the last one in this series, and we're going to talk about the urinary system. Before I do that, as I always do, I want to thank my friends and colleagues who provided me their wonderful images, which allowed me to put this particular series of pathology of the dog together. Let's start with a phenomenal picture by Dr. Paul Stromberg. And this is tissue from a puppy. The morphologic diagnosis would be a multifocal coalescing, necrohemorrhagic nephritis. And this is often seen in puppies less than 10 days of age who are not quite able to maintain their temperature yet. And it's caused by canine herpes virus type one. It's often part of a systemic infection and you can see areas of necrosis with viral inclusions in a number of organs, including the liver, the adrenals, and a number, but the lesion in the cortex of the kidney is often quite striking. If you increase the age of this puppy a little more, up to about a month of age, you can see a very similar lesion with canine adenovirus type 1, which due to its tropism for endothelium, mesothelium, hepatocytes, and renal tubular epithelium will cause hemorrhage and necrosis in a number of areas. A very almost pathognomonic associated lesion that you might see is brainstem hemorrhage in these animals. Canine serpes and virus uh, really likes temperatures a little less than normal body temperature of the dog. So it goes after the puppies before they can regulate the temperature. I have seen over the years a number of cases in adult military working dogs, maybe stressed animals or something like that, that allows this virus, which probably is latent, to take hold and cause systemic infection again. Canine herpes virus infection in utero has also been linked to renal dysplasia. Also has, has been feline panleukopenia virus and bovine viral diarrhea or bovine pestivirus. Here's a great picture that shows a combination of acute and chronic infarcts in the kidney. Infarcts in the kidney are, are generally rewarding on a number of levels. It's not difficult to tell an acute infarct, which is bright red, from chronic infarcts, which generally are white due to either in infiltration by inflammatory cells or fibrosis or both. You can also tell what's been infarcted because the infarcts generally end at a point in the infarcted area. So we can see that this interlobular area, which supplies both the medulla and the cortex uh, has been infarcted. Let me make sure I had that right. This is the interlobar artery. And then you have the arcuate arteries here and branching off of those moving up into the cortex are end arteries called interlobular arteries. So interlobar here affecting this whole area, which is our acute infarct. And then we see multiple infarcts of the interlobular arteries. When we think about causes of renal infarcts, uh, one of the things that you really want to look for in these particular animals is valvular endocarditis, especially septic valvular endocarditis. So when I see a big infarct in the kidney, the next tissue I go to, that's metaphorically speaking because I have a particular way and generally I've looked at the heart before I've looked at the kidneys. But I guess if I was just going to go willy-nilly and pull the kidney out and I saw this, next thing I would do would be to head straight for the heart, preferably the left side. And then you have to think about the potential causes for endocarditis, as we've talked about in pretty much every cardiovascular lecture that I give. Think staph, strep, or a coliform. The fact that we have had what appears to be intermittent infarction suggests that maybe this animal has been shedding a th emboli from that uh, damaged valve. 
not all uh, cases of vegetative valvular endocarditis or mural endocarditis are septic. The majority are, but there are also sterile forms of these diseases. This has been referred to as marantic endocarditis. So that's a new word for you that probably most of your friends don't know. I think you probably also have to consider conditions that might cause systemic thrombosis. Uh, neoplasia would be one. Pancreatitis, steroid administration, which inhibits tri tissue plasminogen activators. And then, of course, glomerulonephritis itself. Anything that causes the loss of antithrombin-3 can put the animal into a coagulative phase. And sometimes in animals with either severe amyloidosis, glomerulonephritis, you might even see uh, venous infarcts that affect the whole kidney. Now this is a kidney that looks a little similar, but as you notice, um, these particular areas of hemorrhage, and remember we talk about when we look at hemorrhage, we're probably looking at necrosis, are paired up with a couple of other key signs. So it'll help clue you into this sometimes difficult disease to identify. We're talking about pyelonephritis. Pyelonephritis is an ascending infection from the urinary tract through the renal pelvis, which goes up the collecting ducts and eventually will dump out into the cortex. This one, you can see there's areas of hemorrhage in the cortex. So it's done a pretty complete job. Other things that I look for, you will see this sort of triangular ray appearance. It's not solid. There are areas that are unaffected in here. And if you look down here at the pelvis itself, it's widened. You see that a lot in, uh, in pyelonephritis due to increased pressure at the renal pelvis by the presence of inflammatory cells and edema and necrosis going on. So the pelvis tends to become necrotic and wear away. We can see these areas of pelvic necrosis right here. So we have a widened pelvis. We have evidence of renal pel uh, pelvic necrosis or papillary necrosis here. And then we have these sort of ill-defined rays. Oftentimes, uh, the ones at the poles of the kidney may be a little more severe, probably because of the turns of the blood vessels in here. And and also the tubules as well. Now, pyelonephritis depends on essentially abnormal reflux of bacteria in the urine. There's a lot of protective mechanisms that uh, have to fail before this particular condition uh, occurs. You know, the ureters have peristaltic movements just like the GI tract, and so they push the urine down. Unfortunately, some uh, pathogenic bacteria especially uh, pathogenic E. coli's, have the ability to uh, inhibit ureteral uh, peristalsis. Also, swelling of the ureter and swelling of the, uh, the bladder and inflammation where they, these dump into the trigon can also compromise the vesicoureteral valve, which usually keeps urine from flowing back up into the kidney. It's a one-way system that pathogenic bacteria for the urinary tract are able to get around. When we get into the kidney itself, when we look at the kidney, the medulla has a very poor blood supply. As I've said in a number of lectures, the vasa recta that, that supply uh, the blood to the medulla are very, very thin. They require a constant uh, influx of prostaglandins I2 and E2 to uh, uh, simply maintain patency or they will slam shut, adding to the ischemia in the kidney. And a lot of these animals may be treated with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, um, which in themselves will inhibit the production of these prostaglandins. Also in the medulla, there is a very high osmolality you know, we have this concentration gradient, and the osmolality is much higher here than it is in the rest of the cortex. But that inhibits neutrophils, 
the high ammonia concentration in the kidney, especially in the medulla, inhibits complement. So we have a lot of things that make the, uh, the medulla of the kidney somewhat susceptible to infection. And then uropathogenic coliforms have their own army of uh, pathogenic factors which help them colonize the urinary tract, including uh, fimbria and adhesins for transitional epithelium and alpha homolysins, which help to uh, uh, break down blood products and inhibit phagocytosis. When you're thinking about the causes, um, any coliform is a good one in the dog. E. coli is the most common, but uh, Klebsiella, Proteus, Pseudomonas. And also don't forget about Staph and Strep as well. If this is an acute case of pyelonephritis, this type of scarring is often what you will see in chronic pyelonephritis. Okay, and look, we have a large scar at the poles. I said it's often worse at the poles. So chronic pyelonephritis kidney in the dog will often have cortical depressions at the poles. Nephrosclerosis, okay, literally a stone of a kidney. Um, and this is the end stage of a process that affects many kidneys of older dogs over their lifetime. Usually it doesn't kill them. This is one that probably did. Look, there's no, at least grossly, functional kidney. What caused this? Can't tell you at this point. This is one that all you can say is that the proximate cause is not evident at this stage in lesion development. I like that. A cause cannot be ascertained at this stage in lesion development because this kidney's all gone. There are some, there's evidence of infarction here Maybe it was pyelonephritis. The, the uh, pelvis doesn't look all that bad. Maybe this was one of the breeds that get uh, renal dysplasia. And there are many of them. I think that the number of dog breeds at this point which don't get some form of familial renal dysplasia is probably shorter than the ones that do. So maybe this was a Lhasa Apso or one of those breeds that uh, Basenjis that have their own renal dysplasia. Or maybe there, this was just fair wear and tear. Maybe this animal got in some toxin and survived but was never treated. At this point, I can't tell you. I can tell you that I will be looking for a pattern of metastatic calcification in this dog. I might look for fibrous osteodystrophy. I might look for all of the things we've said are associated with uremia and a decrease in renal mass. And to get the full list, you got to look at the other 10 lectures. Sorry about that. Hydronephrosis. Is this not the most beautiful picture of hydronephrosis that you will ever see? There is absolutely nothing left except for the stroma of the kidney. All of the cortex is gone. What's the cause? It's obstruction. Can't tell you where the obstruction was. I can't tell you how it happened. All I can tell you is there's nothing left of this kidney. The problem with the kidney is that it has no feedback mechanism to detect obstruction, or well, the entire urinary tract has no feedback mechanism to detect obstruction. You could have obstruction anywhere from the renal pelvis down through the tip of the penis in a male dog. You get the same lesion because nothing ever tells the kidney to stop processing urine. Hey, we got a blockage in the system. So it continues to produce urine in the face of blockage. You have a backup, you have uh, pressure within the cortex, and this begins the process of pressure atrophy. Okay, And then it becomes sort of a vicious cycle because pressure atrophy results in apoptosis of tubular epithelium which then decreases concentrating ability, worsening the problem, and sort of increasing the production of fluid. Okay, at this point, blood vessels will be compressed, especially in that very weak medulla, resulting in papillary necrosis. The rupture of tubules releases uh, urine into the interstitium, um, resulting in the 
uh, concomitant inflammation, release of vasoactive factors, TGF beta, ultimately giving fibrosis. After three weeks of complete obstruction, the change in renal function is now irreversible. And if obstruction is not relieved, it will progress to this particular state. Usually what you see in most cases is you see a extremely wide renal pelvis. You may see hints of the stroma of the calyces. Never seen another one quite like this. Okay, inflammatory disease, chronic inflammation of any type, most commonly associated with uh, infectious agents like heartworm disease uh, or lichiosis, but it may also be chronic autoimmune diseases, may give rise to glomerulonephritis. Glomerulonephritis is almost always a result of chronic inflammation. It may be uh, that the body's uh, defenses are directed against uh, certain components of the body. English cockers get one for abnormal type 4 collagen. A bull terriers get one that's similar to Alpore syndrome. So there are a number of familial glomerulonephritis, but the vast majority of them have to do with chronic immune mediated disease. The gross diagnosis of glomerulonephritis is difficult. Um, in the acute stages, the kidneys are enlarged. They're often a tan color. I generally say tan color of kidneys in species other than cats and pigs. Uh, well, let's just say cats. I'm going to leave it at cats. Um, is often due to glomerulonephritis. Uh, tan color in pigs, in my experience, is more likely due to a renal toxin. But in most species, when the kidneys are big and gold. I'm thinking glomerulonephritis. That works out really well in uh, species that get a lot of it, like rats with chronic progressive uh, glomerulopathy, of which a major component is glomerulonephritis. So this gold color um, may be due glomerulonephritis. And then on cut section, the tissue is going to bulge a little bit. And if you're really lucky, you're going to see this reddish outline of all of the glomeruli. But I do have to, I'll say I do have trouble diagnosing glomerulonephritis. That's why God made microscopes, to help us with this particular diagnosis. Now, here's another golden kidney. I did say that uh, toxins can cause this as well. And the interesting part about this is when you get up close, we don't see all those little glomeruli. What we see are these little reflective patches that are primarily concentrated in the cortex, but they go all the way down into the medulla. And these are oxalate crystals. And if you put this on the microscope, you'd be absolutely knocked out by the amount of oxalate crystals within the tubules. They're these little beautiful birefringent fan-shaped tubules, which pop up in the renal tubules. They expand and they cause necrosis of the tubular epithelium where there are some familial forms of oxalosis in the dog and the cat, our pet species. The number one cause of this is access to antifreeze. Now, within the last 10 years, we've seen, uh, we've seen car companies go away from ethylene glycol um, as the major component of antifreeze, but there's still enough of it out there and enough companies producing it that, that ethylene glycol toxicity is still a problem. And I'm sure it's a problem in other countries as well. Ethylene glycol, like propylene glycol, has a very sweet taste. And animals, once they taste it, are going to continue to, to lick it. And it doesn't take a whole lot to poison an animal. Um, the alcohol dehydrogenase enzymes of the liver breaks ethylene glycol down into glycolic acid, glycoaldehyde, and oxalate. Now, the, the initial problems are going to be due to the glycolic acid that is produced because these animals will become very acidotic. They'll have neuromuscular function. And actually, the precipitation of the oxalate when it complexes with calcium in the tubules is something that is seen in later stages of the disease. Um, these crystals, when they're in those tubules, will block 
these tubules up as well as cause direct damage to the tubular epithelium. In some cases, when you have just tremendous amount of crystals, it may complex with so much calcium that these animals may show a mild hypercalcemia. And in these severe cases, you can also see precipitation of oxalate crystals within the lumen of blood vessels throughout the body and even the brain. Another cause of sort of tan kidneys is going to be uh, lipid. If there's a tremendous amount of lipid which starts collecting in the loop of Henley, as seen in this case, then you want to think of a couple of different conditions. Diabetes um, or hypothyroidism or even hyperadrenocorticism or Cushing disease. All of these may cause lipid accumulation within the kidney as well as uh, in other organs such as the liver. It usually accumulates in the loop of Henley in the dog. In cats you see it through the entire nephron and you can really see these glomeruli as well. So I'm wondering if this animal may also have a bit of glomerulonephritis on top of everything else. Well, we saw this part of this uh, lesion earlier when we were talking about pyelonephritis. Here is one that all we see is this area of papillary necrosis. Whereas it's nice to say, oh, this is due to non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents, which cause decreased production of prostaglandin and the vasorectus slam shut, and then you have ischemic necrosis. Okay, there are another number of other causes um, or secondary causes. So anything that raises the pressure, we've talked about obstruction. Um, you could have uh, stones in the renal pelvis. Um, renal amyloidosis with deposition within the medulla. Um, so essentially anything that prevents the blood from coming down into medulla is going to cause renal papillary necrosis. Renal hypotension uh, that usually results in cortical necrosis um, due to the shunting of arterial blood flow to the juxtamedullary nephron. So this is not usually something that you will see with uh, renal ischemia. It has also been seen or demonstrated in racing greyhounds who are severely dehydrated. I'm sure the same thing would happen in sled dogs as well. So renal papillary necrosis, if you're going to think of nonsteroidals, I think that's a good place to start to realize anything increasing pressure within the medulla is going to do the same thing to those weak little spindly vasorecta vessels. Here is a uh, a condition that I think is very difficult and I always had trouble uh, as a resident learning how to identify this particular disease. Um, they're generally on cross inspection or cut section, no real visual uh, indicators in this. The kidneys are often somewhat uh, enlarged and some of them, not all of them, will have this brownish discoloration. And this is what we see in dogs with amyloidosis. Amyloidosis, like glomerulonephritis, is almost always reactive. Amyloid is a serum, uh, is an acute phase protein. It is made in the liver and is generally increased in production during inflammatory disease. Uh, in, it's seen in about 25% of cases of proteinuria across the board. And in the dog, as opposed to other species, it's usually glomerular deposition. Medullary amyloid, which is rare, is even more difficult to see. There are a number of breeds who are predisposed. I always say as long as we have Sharpays, we'll always have amyloidosis. But also great collies and English foxhounds have breed dispositions for the development of renal amyloidosis. Now, something that might help you in the 
autopsy room, but won't help you with a picture, is the application of Lugol's iodine, because uh, amyloid being a starch will turn a brownish color or a more brown color with application of Lugol's iodine. Just a note on medullary amyloidosis, that's usually in the Sharpays. And in cases where the amyloid is medullary, there's usually little or no proteinuria as a clinical sign. Whereas amyloidosis may be uh, uh, clinically diagnosable in multiple organs in many species, where you can tell grossly that there's intestinal as well as, as, well as renal as well as liver. In dogs, if you pick it up grossly, you're only going to see it in the kidneys. You may pick it up in other organs histologically, including the liver or pulmonary vessels, but usually grossly. The kidney is about the only organ that will occasionally demonstrate gross lesions that you can point to and say, ah, this animal has amyloidosis because so many have proteinuria. A lot of times you're split between whether it's glomerulonephritis or amyloidosis if you don't have a biopsy um, to look at previously. It's a really nice picture here. If you're looking at it, you're saying, I'm not really seeing anything. Look at this pelvic fat. Okay, remember the pelvis should be white, the fat. So this is yellow. This animal actually has severe icterus as a result of severe damage to the uh, uh, tubules. The, the entire kidney appears discolored. And this is a case of, of what is known as hemoglobinuric nephrosis. And this probably animal probably had immune-mediated hemolytic anemia. It can be absolutely devastating to adult dogs, especially when IgM is the, uh, the active antibody. And so you get rapid hemolysis. You have flooding of the tubules with hemoglobin, which can do a little bit of damage. But in these dogs, actually, the, the term is hemoglobinuric nephrosis. I don't like it because what they do to treat these dogs is they pump them full of synthetic hemoglobin. So... Um, what the lesion is, the damage to the kidneys in this form of acute tubular necrosis is much more the result of shock and ischemia uh, rather than damage due to hemoglobin. I'm not going to say that the, the hemoglobin doesn't cause a little bit of damage due to the Fenton reaction, but it's not the main cause of, uh, of the extensive renal necrosis that you will see in this. Okay, we're going to finish up this lecture with tumors or neoplasms of the kidney. And there are uh, actually a full. No, actually, uh, we haven't covered urolith, so I think those are coming up too. Okay, um, this is a very common tumor in the dog. If you look for it, oh, they go by multiple names. They're almost always seen at the, uh, the corticomedullary junction. And these are renal interstitial cell tumors or renal fibromas. Um, the interstitial cell tumors, and how they got that, well, they live in the interstitium. They also have ultrastructurally cytoplasmic lipid droplets, or like you would see in the testis. Some people just call them renal fibromas, thinking that these interstitial cells are pr primarily responsible for the fibrosis. But uh, if you look for them, you will see them. Um, you may see them histologically. Um, and they're just small expansile nodules of proliferating interstitial cells. Renal adenomas or adenocarcinomas are the most common primary tumor of the dog kidney. They often have a fair amount of necrosis grossly. They, uh, they tend to metastasize fairly widely to the lungs and the liver and the adrenal and the lymph nodes. Something else that they will occasionally do is they will liberate erythropoietin. Remember, erythropoietin is normally pr produced in the cortex of the kidney. So they may liberate that and cause a paraneoplastic syndrome of uh, polycythemia as well. And then in the uh, lecture that we had on uh, skin tumors of the dog, remember that these tumors may be associated in German shepherds with nodular dermal fibrosis 
and in female dogs with uterine leiomyomas forming sort of a triad or the trifecta of uh, renal tumors in German Shepherds. Well, here's a big uh, hemangiosarcoma. Hemangiosarcomas can pop up in any organ. This could be primary because every organ has blood vessels. The other thing I hope that you noticed were two other lesions. Large area of hydronephrosis here. Okay, pressure atrophy because this obviously was blocking the ureteral outflow of urine. And then if you looked really closely here and here, here's the papillary, it's not, a, it's not the papilla anymore. But uh, if we were in the pelvis, this would be renal papillary necrosis. A little bit going on the leading edge of this tumor here. Lymphoma. Uh, sure, you'll see lymphoma in dogs. Uh, not like in rabbits. Almost every rabbit, I think maybe 100% of rabbits that get lymphoma get it in the kidneys. But uh, very common in dog kidneys as well, commonly very commonly uh, seen as a metastatic site. If you've been in practice, you've seen obstructed animals. Um, here's a animal with a very large bladder. You can see this in animals that are hit by cars that have uh, trauma to the hips. It's very painful to urinate in that particular condition. The other thing I would be thinking about in here might be some form of hemolysis. This spleen looks a little bit big to me. Um, so you want to think about uh, anything that might cause extravascular hemolysis or even intravascular hemolysis since the urine looks fairly blood blood tinged. So maybe babesiosis or autoimmune hemolytic anemia or leptospirosis or even mycoplasma hemocanus could cause a big spleen and blood colored urine. If you said that this was a, uh, uh, a urinary bladder tumor. I'm not going to fight with you too much on that because it certainly could be. However, the other thing that I want you to look at, it looks like this is these are sort of polyps. And polypoid cystitis um, is a common sequela to urolithiasis. Um, urolithiasis causes a lot of changes in the actual bladder once you take the stones out. Bladder walls are generally thickened. You can have polyp formation. You can have a, a variety of different forms of cystitis, including follicular cystitis. So uh, for polypoid cystitis, probably the number one cause is going to be uh, uroliths and concomitant bacterial urinary tract infections. In people, um, because doctors like to go up in there with instruments and poke around a little bit, um, a lot of cases of polypoid cystitis are due to quote unquote repeated instrumentation. So polypoid cystitis, look for a predisposing cause. And I think sometimes we get so excited about looking at polypoid cystitis, we're not thinking, well, something had to cause that. I mentioned before follicular cystitis. If you took a biopsy of this, all these little raised sort of whitish nodules with a red ring around it, these would all be well-developed lymphoid follicles. Um, and once again, antigenic stimulation. So look for chronic bacterial urinary tract infection with or without stone formation. Oh, here's a great picture of emphysematous cystitis. Okay, and you have all these little bubbles in the bladder and usually this is the result of either diabetes mellitus or that somebody's been pushing uh, fluids containing uh, glucose in them and if there is bacteria within the bladder that has the ability to ferment that you can have the formation of mucosal uh, emphysematous areas, so-called emphysematous cystitis, but take sugar and it probably takes a bacterial urinary tract infection to get that. Remember a lot of these animals with diabetes mellitus um, do have chronic uh, bacterial urinary tract infections because that glucose is a tremendous substrate for some of these uropathogenic bacteria. 
Okay, Euralis. I want you to take every picture I show you of Euralis and this dog, you're going to have a markedly thickened bladder wall. You may have polypoid areas, you may have follicular areas, but they are always associated with a markedly thickened wall. Euralis are most commonly found, believe it or not, in the ureter. And that's probably because there they, f they cause obstruction and significant clinical signs. Um, least commonly found in the renal pelvis. Urinary stone formation in most cases is uh, reliant on an alkaline urinary pH, a bacterial urinary traction, and some form of reduced water intake. Struvite stones are still the most common in dogs, and you will see other stones in a minute, some of which are predisposed, but uh, struvite stones are the most common. They can be very large. They're often flattened on one side because they're pressed up against another stone during uh, uh, formation. The importance um, of bacteria is that they will split urea. They will actually increase the pH, and most of these stones will precipitate well in alkaline pH urine. They're often treated by the uh, partially by the administration of urinary acidifiers. Here's an absolutely fantastic picture of uh, a particular form of urolithiasis which is seen in Dalmatians and in English Bulldogs or any dog that has a portosystemic shunt. These are uh, Billy Rubin stones. Once again, Take a look at the thickened bladder wall. And you can see it's even starting to grow up around some of these stones. Somebody popped one out here, so you have a little divot. The stones are actually ammonium biurate. Once again, uh, precipitate out in a higher than normal pH. But the problem with Dalmatians is they often have problems with this due to a decreased uptake of uric acid into the hepatocytes um, as a result of a membrane defect. Um, if they can get the urates uh, into the hepatocytes, they process it normally. Hepatocellular uricase is normal in these animals, but affected animals will show a uh, higher plasma uric acid than normal dogs, and it will eventually precipitate out in the urine. It goes straight into the urine and comes out and in the presence of an alkaline urine will form these very characteristic yellow green stones. I've seen some that are bright green as well. So anything that's yellow green in a Dalmatian or an English Bulldog with these defects um, you want to think about. Animals with uh, chronic cirrhosis um, and a, a por acquired portosystemic shunts will develop these because the uric acid isn't presented to the liver to be removed and is increased amounts in the urinary filtrate. The fact that these animals also often have a concurrent hyperaminemia contributes to the high pH in the urine which is also required for precipitation of these stones. Here's a fun one. Um, and these are silicate stones. They're pretty rare. They're 75% silica dioxide. You see them a lot more often in ruminants. Um, animals that eat a lot of grass may develop these. And uh, somebody say these have the highest rate of obstruction. Well, I can imagine if you have something that looks like that in the urinary bladder, um, or even like this that might pass down, that's probably a little more likely to get obstructed than your normal round struvite stone. Um, oh, German Shepherds and Sheepdogs seem to be uh, predisposed. I don't know why old English sheepdogs get a lot of these. Maybe they're out there grazing on grass with the sheep. Now we're going to finish up with the tumors of the urinary bladder. And there aren't a whole lot that uh, you need to know about. The one that you uh, really should know about is transitional cell carcinoma. Um, or urothelial carcinoma, and this is the most common primary tumor of the urinary tract in dogs, in male dogs. It tends to uh, pop up in highest numbers in the area of the prostatic urethra, and in those cases will infiltrate the prostate. We've talked about this 
uh, in a previous lecture, and many of the tumors which were initially diagnosed as prostatic carcinoma back in the days before immuno, um, when immuno came along and uroplakin was developed, you can now see that they are transitional cell carcinomas. Um, in females, most commonly seen in the ureters and urethra. Many of the textbooks state that they often arise in the trigome. Maybe that's because they're coming from the urethra. My experience is that I haven't seen that the trigone is any more predisposed to development of these tumors than any other part of the bladder. They tend to be pleomorphic. Um, they're not a difficult histologic uh, diagnosis. The, the cells often have large cytoplasmic vacuoles within them. So when you get a large nest of these cells, it sort of looks like a sieve or a colander or a, 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 a salad spinner because they have all these holes in it. Um, they metastasize uh, fairly widely. They can be extremely aggressive. And metastasis is usually first seen in the lymph nodes um, right by the aortic bifurcation. They can go to bone if they want. They can go pretty much anywhere they want and uh, animals that are untreated may have up to 50% metastasis. And finally, a, a neoplasm of the you know, of young dogs um, that has a sort of grape-like appearance is a so-called botryoid rhabdomyosarcoma. They supposedly arise from uh, uh, embryonal myoblasts of the urogenital ridge and usually seen in large breed dogs younger than 18 months. I was taught that the dogma is if the tumor arises in the fundus of the bladder, farthest away from the uh, urethra, that that is a more likely to be a botryoid, and if it arose in the trigone, it's more likely to be transitional cell carcinoma. Well, here's a botryoid one that's arising in the trigone. So um, that's conventional wisdom that hasn't worked out for me, but these do have a very nice polypoid or botryoid, botryoid meaning grape-like uh, appearance to them. And once again, anything causes, look at the thickening of the bladder wall. So anything that's going on in the bladder is probably going to cause a thickened bladder wall due to uh, a lot of edema and inflammation. Okay, well that completes this lecture on the selected gross pathology of the dog. Uh, if you really enjoy the urinary system, I have a series of lectures on the urinary system, which is available at, on our YouTube channel, on our uh, the, the Joint Pathologies video library, as are all of these lectures on uh, gross pathology of the dog. Um, I've enjoyed putting these together. I've enjoyed presenting them to you. I hope that you've enjoyed them as much. Uh, take a day or two break. And then we will launch into the gross pathology of the cat. Not that different from the dog. It's a somewhat shorter series of lectures because we've talked about a lot of these things. We'll refer back to some of these lectures. But uh, hope you'll come back for those or, or some of the other lectures available through the Joint Pathology Center or the Davis Thompson Foundation. With that, as always, I wish you great health and a great day.